Hello, Rapidly Aging Technology editing me here. It appears that this video has a few instances, particularly at the beginning, uh, of sound artifacting when the camera appears to be when the camera is near the uh, Wi-Fi unit. When close to the wireless unit, it seems to have an effect on the audio. I'm not sure whether it's having an effect directly on the microphone and then thus translating to the camera or whether it's having an effect on the camera itself. Right now I'm just recording at my desk using an old um, beige desk mic, something that I got after I got rid of my old one after years of never using it. This is right when I went off to college. I had it for ages. My dad gave it to me and never used it, so I got this one. And if it sounds a little funny, that's because I'm using noise reduction just because right next to the computer tower, well, it's a bit, it's a noisy computer tower. Remember, I'm air cooling in FX9590, so, it, it, and I used fans that are capable of being very fast. So it tends to be a little on the noisy side. Anyway, I just want to chime in and say, you're going to hear some, some um, audio issues. I'm sorry about that. I can't really make them go away properly, um, but stick through it because they're not in the entire video. Um, they're not in every scene or every, every, uh, every little emotion. So keep that in mind. Um, and in the future, because it's, it's happened twice now, I'm going to just make sure I'm far away from the Wi-Fi, you know, whenever I do anything. Uh, it appears to be that. I don't think it has anything to do with the CB antennas, since I'm not broadcasting with CB, so it really shouldn't be affecting anything. All those CB frequencies are already floating out there, and I doubt um, a, an antenna sitting over there would somehow make them uh, affect the camera. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this episode of Rapidly Aging Technology, and there you go. Enjoy. I'm sorry about all the weird sound issues. You'll, you'll, you'll know them when you hear them. I'll talk to you later, and on to the video. So this is the microphone without using any noise reduction, in case you were wondering. It seems to pick up some fuzziness. I'm not sure if some of it is the microphone itself. Also... Here's a fun little factoid. When I put my hand near it, it seems to get a little louder. I'm not sure what uh, exactly that is. I'm sure there's probably a scientific name for it. There's an effect of it. Um, but there you go. That's the mic. Back to the movie. Video. Gosh darn it. Hello and welcome to another episode of Rapidly Aging Tech. Today, we are going to be switching out the hard drives in this machine. As I mentioned in my previous video, the one of the drives at least has started the click of death. The machine still functions and the click is intermittent. There are periods where it stops and there are periods where it starts up again. But it gave me an opportunity after a terrifying backup of all my data and cloning spare hard drives just for back in case something went wrong before the new ones arrived. I took it as an opportunity to upgrade. So my boot drive, which used to be a Velociraptor, second drive is a Velociraptor as well, the boot drive is now going to be a Samsung uh, 950 Pro, as opposed to the Evo. Um, the transfer speeds are more or less the same. The Pro is a bit faster. Um, and either read or write by 100 megabytes a second or something. 10, sorry, it's a very small difference. But the warranty on this is 10 years, as opposed to five on the Evo and I like warranties. It's still, even though it's a one terabyte model and the high class, you know, pro version, it still feels not very substantial. It feels kind of hollow still. Anyway, this is going to be a multi-day video because the secondary drives replacement has not showed up yet. That is going to be something special. So, but today we're going to get this in, we'll stop the video and resume filming once the next second drive is in. First order of business is to unplug my computer from all the things it's plugged into and then crack it open which as you can probably tell already is a number of things I wasn't lying look at all the cables all the different things here um, 
I've used up a lot of my USB connectors with all this nonsense and of course lots of audio connections and whatnot. It's quite a mess. These um, are eSATA connectors that go into uh, a couple of internal ports that are a secondary chip. The 990FX chipset uh, supports natively six, six or so SATA ports and an Azalea, is it Azalea? Asmedia? I think it's Asmedia. Um, chip is used to control another two. Well, during my attempts to save the data on this computer, I grabbed a spare one terabyte drive that I was given and plugged it in as I have with other drives. And I had a very hard time seeing it. I think the drive is bad because I tried it with a USB to SATA connector as well. But now whenever I try to plug anything else into these, it just doesn't seem, Windows just doesn't see it. Um, disk management utility doesn't see it. Nothing seems to see it. Uh, I don't know whether that controller has gone bad or whether it's just uh, that exposure to that bad drive, it's maybe still looking for it. And since those other drives don't match, it is throwing a fit. I don't know. I'm hoping that after we do all this switch out and whatnot, maybe it'll soar back to life. Though I may just change the internal connectors so that instead of going to that um, as media chip, it just goes to the main uh, 990FX chipset and we set those ports to external, which is an option in the BIOS. So there's a few, th a couple things we'll be doing. All right, I've unplugged all the cords. I've cracked open the case, front and back. I even blew out some dust, it's still dusty. Now we're ready to put in the solid state drive to replace uh, the C drive, which is the most important one to switch out, I think, first. Uh, I don't know whether I want to say hopefully it's one with the problems or not. I think E is the drive with the problems, though. Look at that massive cooler. I really do love this build, though, of course, my cable management is terrible. In case you were wondering, you know, what was all plugged in behind that computer, well, here's a majority of the stuff. There's still, um, an external floppy drive, uh, a Firewire DVD burner, some other things that are uh, not accounted for here. Of course, this is the subwoofer. All right, back to the computer case. I have shown it in other uh, videos before, but this is the back of my case. It uses an ASUS Crosshair 5 Formula Z. And it has, of course, a uh, dual purpose PS2 port. Uh, PS2 ports are fairly essential for me since I prefer older keyboards to USB 2.0. Um, presumably for keyboard and mouse, just for backwards compatibility. USB 2, USB 3. Three more USB 2, and actually that's, I think that's four, and that's a ROG Connect USB port. So you can theoretically access the motherboard and whatnot from another computer if you need to. Two more USB uh, 2. Two external SATA ports, which might be more reliable than the lower ones, which you'll see. Two more USB 2, so those were USB 3 if I, did, if I said 2. Um, gigabit Ethernet, the built-in sound card, which is pretty good, but I improved. The XFX R9 Fury, the non-X version. Um, it actually, it's while it's officially two slot, it kind of, it's more like two and a half, so you can't actually use um, the other PCI Express slot. Parallel port and serial port. Firewire 800 and 400. Two are 800 ports, one's 400. Then the Sound Blaster ZXR main card, which has your sub center in your um, satellite speakers. Uh, RCA, red and white for left and right out. Two quarter-inch jacks um, that can be used for um, mic and headphone, but are actually uh, intended to be used with the audio control module. It's more, it's just a, it's just a breakout box that has a volume control that you can use for uh, headphones and mic. Uh, SATA external connector um, bracket along with Molex power. This is connected to the AS Media chipset. And then we have the daughter card, which is RCA in and then um, optical in and out. 
and then the seasonic power supply. So I'm actually going to leave that alone and see if I can get it to work. If I can't, I'll just use these um, upper external SATA ports, because why not? All right, so let's get the hard drive change going. We're in the back of the motherboard tray, and I had to consult one of my old videos to remember which was E and which was C. C is actually down lower, so I'm going to have to undo those plugs. And that's the E drive, which will be switched out soon enough. All right, lighting isn't the greatest. I don't have my flashlight or anything, but I think we can probably... Oh dear. Well, I'm sure I can get the SATA power to come out. I don't think this is going to be much to watch, and I'm going to need two hands. So just... You know what I'm doing. I'm pulling out that plug. I'm pulling out that plug. You, you understand. We'll return when I'm done with that. All right, that's been done. Let's pull out the drive. And here we go. This one I actually suspect is probably still good, but I'm replacing both of them just in case. I do love the Lost Raptor series, um, but as I mentioned before, these were both used drives. And they could have been uh, abused by their previous owners, or they were weak, or one of them could be weak. Uh, you never really can tell. So, time to do the switcheroo. So with these drive sleds, it's not actually anything you know magic you need to do. If they're not screwed in, which they are not, they're just some metal nubbins, and you more or less just stretch the holder until it lets the drive out. And there we go. If you're going to have a hard drive as your boot drive, these are some of the best ones. They come with a big old heat sink arrangement, which theoretically you could just plug into, you could, you could get some of these heat sinks and put your SSDs in them and they should work just fine. Um, I don't have a spare one, so I'm not gonna do that, but these Western Digital Lost Raptors only um, were surpassed consistently, I think by the a Western Digital Black 6 terabyte drives due to their data density. They spin slower, but with the advancements that have been made since the Velociraptor series was last released, and I don't remember the date, I said 2012, I should probably have a correction come up here somewhere. Um, so these, they're still pretty, for drive hard drives, they're still pretty good. But, well, I guess I'm moving on to an SSD. Um, good night, sweet prince. There, now we have the Samsung drive, which is now in an adapter for a three and a half inch. Hopefully I screwed it in the right way to make that work. Just a little Sabrent cheapo thing, which is nice because it's, it's metal and it's not contacting it too much. So this um, SSDs do get warm. Hopefully this one won't get too warm. So now we'll just put it in. One side is in. Now we'll just. Usually I do this with two hands, but I'm 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 not using the tripod tonight. Oh dear. Get in there. Okay, we're going to hand it. And there we go. Now it's in. Now it's in there. I'll plug it in the back and get the machine all hooked back up. And I'm not going to torture you with that because this is going to be a man bumbling around, plugging in USB cables, trying to remember which ones should be going to USB 3.0 ports, which ones can go into two, um, and then trying to keep them organized so they're not tugging on each other. The audio ports are gonna be fun because there's a bunch there. All right, so that look, took a lot more fiddling than you would expect. There was a lip on the SATA, uh, there's a lip on the SSD holder, which resulted in me having to switch the SATA cable around to uh, the 90 degree connector on the motherboard and then the, the straight traditional connector onto the drive. Had to flip positions with the other Velociraptor so that I could get the end of the power cable. And on top of that, the, uh, 
the clips, uh, one of them is getting about ready to break off on it because plastic. So that was fun. All right, we should have power. Most of the stuff connected except for on top. And here we go. All right, well, it, it beeped. That's good. All right, password here. Let's get into the BIOS here. All right, and now let's find the drive setup. All right, we're in the hard drive boot section, and now we need to move that up in the boot order. All right, so the Samsung should be up at the top. Go back. You should see, there we go. So we always boot first from the floppy. And in this case, it's the inbuilt floppy. It's still using USB, but it's in the case. that uses a TEAK controller, or TAC, I'm not sure how you pronounce that. Then the Blu-ray drive, and then the Samsung. So that should just about do it. Oh, and uh, a little word to the wise. I've noticed that um, I think a lot of these boards, these AM3 Plus boards, they tend to knock down the North Bridge and HT Link speed down um, below what they are kind of should be around about. You can probably bump those up to um, 2600 megahertz and they should be just fine. I did that without modifying voltages or anything to make sure that there wasn't any goofy bandwidth um, being reductions for no reason. I can't remember what it knocked it down to um, but they weren't at their full speed and the FX9590 does in fact um, at least mine is quite happy with 2133 megahertz uh, DDR3 RAM. The AM3 Plus boards do have a north bridge still. It's not a memory controller, but it does control um, the connections between the CPU and the um, PCI Express bus. It's underneath the um, heat sinks with the, the um, power delivery circuitry. So there is a north bridge still, and I think it's the last series to have a north bridge. Everything on Ryzen and Intel for a while, it's all been incorporated entirely into the CPU. Um, thus ends an era. Let's exit and boot. We'll see how quickly this thing boots up. I always have it sit at the post screen for, well, I think it's officially 10 seconds, but um, just so that I have plenty of time to get into the BIOS if I need to. Hopefully it'll boot. And if I haven't mentioned it before, I think I already have. This is the first time I've installed an SSD onto a SATA 3 bus. All right, that was pretty good and quick. Now I'll go in and do the, the thing you always have to do after you um, mirror, after you clone a drive. All right, so you need to go into computer management and disk management. Actually, let me show you how to do that. So you open up your control panel. And this is on Windows 7. I think 10 moved it around a bit. You'll do administrative. You do computer management. And then you will do disk management over here. And so what it always does is there's usually um, some unallocated space. So we're going to um, extend the volume to, there we go, it should let me just do it. Okay, so that's moved everything over. Windows already knows since, since this was a cloning of a drive, it wants to um, restart the computer to do something. That might be to hide the system reserved section, which usually isn't um, displayed. So that's going to be something that we do. 
So we'll do that, and so we'll close there, we'll close that. So now on C, we're also going to tell it to check for errors and do a full check because it's going to have to. It's got some work to do. It's got, you know, it's a clone. It's got to fix some things. So now we're going to restart. Yes, I am running Windows 7. Why do you ask? All right, error checking is completed. And then I went into disk management and just, you can, uh, in disk management, you can change or remove drive letters. In the system, the system, uh, the system partition, the system reserve partition, I removed its drive letter so it's now disappeared from my computer, which is just fine and dandy. Um, went through disk check. Everything seems to be fine so far. Um, I'm getting one script error. It's referring to Facebook, oddly enough. I think it might be related to signing somehow Magic Jack because I don't have my phone connected into it. Um, the Magic Jack device is not connected right now because I um, didn't want to have to put all that stuff on top of the computer in case I had to tear everything down again. But sound is working. Everything seems to be working just fine. And I haven't heard any clicking so far. So maybe it was the C drive that was bad. Oh well, we will be back later once the new secondary hard drive shows up which that'll be a bunch of fun. So I'll see you soon. Um, through the magic of editing, it'll be the same video, and as far as you can tell, the same day, but it's going to be later on in the week. All right, fast forward, Mr. Time Traveler Man. It has been a day or so later, and the hard drive has arrived. And if you've never ordered a Western Digital Drive before, they come in a very nondescript brown box in my experience. Um, inside of a you know larger just general shipping box and the drive is suspended by two of these one on each side and it just kind of sits in there it's inexpensive and I mean, it gets the job done there's definitely some shock prevention in this because it's not actually sitting on the floor of the box and of course the drive comes in one of these so now let's go look at it because I've told you it's gold but I haven't told you what it is here it is the Western Digital 10 terabyte gold, one of their newest models, helium filled. The only model better than this on the market so far is the 12 terabyte, which was I think, I think about $200 more for just two more terabytes. Its performance would be uh, a bit higher, but not by much in this drive. It has 256 megabytes of cache, which is just insane for hard drives. And uh, it's 7200 RPM. And just the sheer data density means that the Western Digital Velociraptor that it's replacing, which I showed earlier because I pulled it out, um, this should outperform it in pretty much everything. I'm sure there might be something where that 10,000 RPM might still provide an advantage, but the differences in data density, the advancements in controllers, and all sorts of stuff make this drive uh, just superior in pretty much every way. And since it's enterprise class, it should last. Um, I care about things lasting a long time. This computer I built, I, anti I, I anticipate it to last me, I uh, hopefully, 10 years. That's my goal. Um, just because in the past, I've always used computers for a very long time. Let's look at the top here. It's not a very loud drive. You might hear it pulsing once or twice. The motor spindle noise is fairly low. It's starting up. It has a kind of a pleasing, almost, it's kind of an old-fashioned sound, um, but not too loud. Probably won't hear it through this case. The fans you hear, because it's a hot system and the fans are fast. I really could knock those fans down a bit. But there you go. That's the drive. So now we're going to clone um, the second hard drive onto it. I'll also note that since I replaced the C drive, I haven't heard clicking anymore. So it must have been the C drive that was actually bad. This is also, because of the size of it, a GPT um, disk rather than master boot record. Master boot record has a limit of about, what was it, 2.2 terabytes. I think there's ways to sneak around it by like raiding multiple partitions together. It's, it's convoluted. So this is um, GPT, um, GUI. D partition table. Um, hopefully in the with text I'll put what that stands for.
but this allows for much larger drives. And I think it's technically more robust because rather than having a single master boot record at the beginning of the drive, there's sort of mini, I'm probably botching this, but mini boot records in multiple locations so that if one fails, it can refer to another one. Um, but it's less compatible. You, if you slap this thing into a Windows XP machine just to pull data off of, um, it's going to have a hard time unless you use probably a special G GPT driver, which I think there might be something out there. Anyway, let's clone it. All right, here we are in MacFrame Reflect. I have the second hard drive in the machine, the one terabyte Velociraptor that remains. Um, it's a master boot record disk. Um, partition E selected. We are going to do clone this disk. Image is just a backup file. If you do that, it'll take a while and you'll end up, it, it doesn't work for what we're trying to do. We're just going to clone it. All right, then it brings up, okay, this is the drive you want to do. Where is it going? And we want to select this massive guy. And we're going to have to do delete our existing partition. So we're just going to do it onto there. And it will figure out what it wants to do. Oh, forgot. You need to check the box to say that's what we're moving to. We're not doing a schedule. Um, this system, Macrium, is designed to allow you to do scheduled clonings. Um, I don't really use it like that, which is fine. All right, that looks right. All right, we're going to run the backup now, but we're not going to save it to a schedule. And we'll click OK, and here we go. Okay, warning, the following drives will be overwritten. F, yes, that's the, de the drive letter currently on the new one. Continue. All right, it's starting the cloning process. Now this should actually go fairly quick because we're moving less than a terabyte, maybe half a terabyte of data over the SATA 3 bus from a Velociraptor, which is a very fast drive, to a drive that's also very fast, the gold, in fact a faster drive, with a lot of cache. So this should actually be a pretty dang quick process, all things considered. So we'll let it go. And when it's back, we'll pop it into the machine. I won't show you that because it's going to be identical to what was on earlier in the video. I will then send it through its um, disk check. And then we'll see if everything's working, which I imagine it probably will. Um, but here we go. All right, the clone completed, completed in about 33 minutes or so. And the total amount of data was 348 gigabytes. So about, about 350 gigabytes. So now what we'll do is we will shut down the computer. I'll let you listen to the uh, spin down of this drive, which I haven't heard yet. I've only heard it spin up. Then I will go through the well, tangled nightmare of switching out um, the drives. Then I'll do the scan disk. And after that's all done, we'll just make sure everything's working. So let's get on that. All right, that was a pretty quiet spin down. All right, we're back in Macrium because I discovered that if you delete the old partitions on the new GPT disk and then clone over the master boot record, what you end up getting is a master boot record disk, which means the first two terabytes are one big old nice partition, and the rest of the disk is just unusable. Um, so what you actually have to do is make the new GPT disk leave it that way, then you take the copy you want to clone and you drag it down into the extra space. So you leave that 120 megabyte unformatted section for whatever the GPT um, system uses it for. And so this should do it. All right, so we'll try that again. There, that looks far better. Now we can extend the partition. Do that, and that, there we go. He has been extended, it's GPT, 
is about 10 terabytes. There we go. So now we'll finally do the disk check. Master boot record is trying to hold on till the end. And I do have, of course, a soft spot for master boot record and prefer it because of backwards compatibility, but I'm going with a drive this big and kind of stuck doing that. All right. We shall see you soon. Uh, 10 terabytes of scan disk. It's taking bloody ages. And it guzzles the RAM for some reason. I've looked into the matter. It's apparently just a scan disk thing, at least in Windows 7. I'm not sure how 8 and 10 do it. Though in my experience of trying to do scan disk with Windows 10, you'd click it, it'd buzz for, you know, 10 seconds to say everything's fine. So I'm not really sure if it's working or whether um, in Windows 10 it just is pandering to you. Oh well. All right, the drive completed um, its disk check, which I even did the full um, scan all the surf scan the surface, just in case. Might as well do it once. Yes, it took overnight. Um, I started in the evening, but it did go overnight and into. I came back um, from lunch, uh, from work, to check on it and finally finished. I mean, it's 10 terabytes. It's a lot of uh, surface area to check. So now we're in Samsung Magician, which um, has a performance benchmark option. So let's look and see how the uh, drive performs. Because I can test the hard drives, not just the SSD. The SSD results are going to be a bit off because I'm now using um, Samsung's rapid um, mode, which actually creates a bit of a RAM disk as well, so the numbers are going to be far too high. All right, so we have a read and write in sequential, which those numbers actually seem actually seem a little on the low side, um, which is a little cons. Eh, who knows? It's just one benchmark, but that seems uh, it should actually be higher than that for sequential stuff, whatnot. Um, but there we go. So now we've seen the performance levels. These I, I don't trust these results exactly. This is built for Samsung. But there we go. The drive is working. The drive is fully recognized with its um, more or less its full capacity. I mean, there's just some of that loss from the from this and that. But it's working. So now I have plenty of storage, and I'm, the next step is to then start uninstalling the big games that are on the C drive, moving them over to E, like World of Tanks, World of Warships, that sort of stuff. Because um, that'll be probably at least 150 gigs moved over, if not more. I think I might have Battlefront over there, too. I'm not sure. Anyway, thanks for joining me um, for this excursion of des desperately saving all my data. It appears to have worked. And I'll talk to you next time. Remember to join the Retro Machines group on Facebook and like and subscribe and all that goofy stuff and shill things and whatnot. Talk to you later. Have a great day.